Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 29, Forms of Energy. The goal of this lecture is to reintroduce each of the forms of energy that we introduced in the last lecture, 28, but this time with more definition and with an equation for each of them. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is bring all of these different forms of energies together to talk about the total energy of a system being conserved. So let's go in the same order that we followed in the last lecture. We're going to start with kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, given by capital letter K, by definition is the energy of motion. In other words, if the object is moving, it has kinetic energy. This quantity, kinetic energy, depends both on the mass of the object m and the speed v at which it is moving. And notice it is heavily dependent on the speed v because that term in the equation is squared. So even a moderate increase to your speed is going to significantly increase your kinetic energy. Now real quick, I'm going to derive this equation. In fact, I'm going to derive all of the equations we introduce. My students do not have to repeat derivation processes, but it is important, I think, to see sometimes where these come from. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of our class. We had uh, an equation from kinematics, the very, very first unit of our material. That was Vx final squared equals Vx initial squared plus 2ax delta x. Well, let's simplify this a little bit. Let's remove all the x subscripts just to make things more simple, and let's write displacement as d. So really, this equation, I'm not doing anything new here. This is just v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2ad. Same exact equation, just written in a slightly different way. Well, let's start expanding this. We have an acceleration in this equation. Let's write that using Newton's second law. Uh, we know from Newton's second law that acceleration is equal to force over mass. So let's write that in, force over mass. Right, F equals MA or A equals F over M. Well, notice what we just wrote here on the top, in other words, in this numerator, F times D. Well, if you recall our last lecture, f times d times cosine theta is work. But in the situation where your angle between the force and displacement is zero, the optimal situation, the equation is just work equals f times d. So really, this just becomes work over mass. OK. Well, we're getting somewhere with this because now what we can do is rearrange this equation for work. So I'm going to rewrite this with work on the left hand side. To rearrange this, I'm going to have to divide everything by 2 and then multiply everything by m. Right, so I'm going to have to divide everything by 2 and multiply everything by m. So what we will see is the following. 1 half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared. And look at the similarity to the equation on the left. So this is work equals a change because it's final minus initial in the kinetic energy. So what we're, we've done is basically define what kinetic energy is. One half mv squared. So really, I mean, this isn't far from what we discussed in the past. Our, the equation we started with in the beginning of our course, the equation at the top of the screen, is directly what led us to this equation for kinetic energy. So it's sometimes beautiful, I think, to see how all of this can be connected. Okay, well, I'm going to erase all this because there's other stuff on the screen. So let me erase that. Now let's look at the units. We have a new term, kinetic energy, so we have to think about what the units would be. Well, we have mass, which is measured in kilograms, 
times velocity squared. So that's meters squared per second squared. So if we left it like that, the units of kinetic energy would be kilogram meter squared per second squared. But that's obviously not ideal. So uh, what we can do here is recognize that a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So a kilogram meter per second squared is a Newton, okay? And that leaves behind just one of those meters. So our units become Newton meters, which in the last lecture we saw is defined as a joule. So the unit of energy, after everything I've just written, is a joule. And that's true for all forms of energy. So I would emphasize that, that the unit of all forms of energy is the joule, just like work. So um, going forward, I would just expect everyone to use joules as the default units. You don't, I mean, if you use this equation and you write your units as kilogram meter squared per second squared, that's not wrong. I wouldn't mark off for that. But you should just get familiar with the joule unit at this point. The table that I included on the right is not one that I expect anyone to reference or memorize. It's really just here for the sake of information. Uh, just giving you a range of completely random kinetic energy values. Um, these are, of course, averages, not exact values. Um, but this is just really here to emphasize the fact that kinetic energy can be really, really small or really, really large. Because for the sake of comparison, I mean, an ant walking has both a small mass and a small velocity. So it's going to have a really small kinetic energy. On the other hand, something like a super tanker, I mean, a super tanker is an incredibly massive object and it can move still fairly fast. So you're going to see a fairly large energy. And actually, looking at this table, I believe there's a typo. Uh, it looks like it has this to the negative fifth power. I believe that would be the fifth power. A car would have a lot of kinetic energy. So, um, so that just gives you a range of values. So this might even help sometimes if you are calculating the kinetic energy of an object. Maybe this table will help you kind of give you a ballpark idea on whether or not you might be correct or not. So, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Let's jump right into an example using this equation. This problem says the following. A 390 kilogram bobsled at rest is pushed straight ahead with a force of 270 newtons along a frictionless surface. What is the speed after 50 meters? Now, sometimes it can be really difficult after everything we've learned in this course to know exactly what equations to apply. I'll tell you, this is a work energy equation problem, but let me show you kind of my thought process and how I figure that out. We're talking about work and energy. There's a key word here of speed. Speed is indicative of the fact that we're going to have kinetic energy. That's the only place that speed shows up. Right, so by the problem mentioning a speed, that's me thinking in my head, okay, I'm going to be using kinetic energy. Also, there's a keyword here for our purposes of force. We are applying a force to this object, which means we are doing work. So there's a connection here. We are doing work and thus we are changing our kinetic energy. So this is a problem based on the work energy equation. Work equals a change in energy. In this particular problem, the energy that we are changing is the kinetic energy. So I'm just going to rewrite this as delta K. Well, I mean, we're asked for a speed. V doesn't show up in this equation as is. We aren't given the work W. We aren't given the kinetic energy K. Clearly, this equation has to expand. And it does, because from our last lecture, we learned that work W is equal to FD cosine theta. And we just learned that kinetic energy is 1 half MV squared. So delta means change, final minus initial, so really, this becomes 1 half mv final squared minus 1 half mv initial squared. 
And so with this, we now have our full equation, the work energy equation written out in full. There is some good news, and this is common in problems where you expand equations. We have a long equation at the time, or at the moment, but note that there is something that might be helpful here. We can assume, or based on the problem, that we're starting at rest. So the initial velocity vi is zero because it's at rest. So that helps us. That means a third of our equation really is just gone before we even really have to do anything. So let's now at this point just apply some algebra. We're solving for the final velocity, All right? So V final, All right? So in this case, just a bit of algebra. I'm gonna, to, to rearrange this, I'm gonna multiply everything by two to get rid of this one half and then divide everything by mass and then take the square root to get rid of the square above the velocity. So uh, doing all of this, we will see the following. The square root of two FD cosine theta divided by the mass. So at this point, we should be able to just plug in our values and solve we have the square root still of two times the force applied, which was 270 newtons, times the displacement of the object, which is told to be 50 meters, times cosine of the angle. Now be careful. From our last discussion, we should know that by definition, the angle we're talking about here should be the angle between your force and your displacement. So if that is the case, we need to make sure we know that angle. It says that it's pushed straight ahead. What we really mean here is that if we have, say, the object here as a box, it's moving straight to the right and it's being pushed straight to the right. So the angle between those is zero degrees. So we have cosine of zero and then divided by the mass of the object, which was 390 kilograms. Well, at this point, we just plug everything in and hope we do it correctly on our calculator, and it should give us uh, roughly 8.3 meters per second. And there you have it. So, I would argue again that the challenge here would be figuring out how to start the problem, right? What equations to apply. So hopefully my reasoning for what I chose makes sense. Um, for those of you in my class, um, my actual students, I will tend to on exams specify, like use the work energy equation or uh, use conservation of momentum or use conservation of energy. It's just, I think at this point in the course, We've learned so much that we have such a big toolbox to pull from uh, that, you know, it, it helps to have a, a pointer to guide you. Uh, so even though I would like students to know from reason why to start here with the work energy equation, it can be challenging. So, um, you know, sometimes it just helps to know what to apply. Okay, so that's kinetic energy, the first of our four main energies. Let's now move on to talking about gravitational potential energy. That is the energy stored when associated with height above a surface. So in this case, we are talking about an object that is either being lifted off of the surface or pulled up off the surface, or say moving up a hill where it's increasing its height above its lowest point. So this gravitational potential energy, which is represented by the symbol U, subscript G, is that stored energy, the energy waiting to be used. Because if you say, just let go of that object suddenly, it's gonna fall back down to the surface. In other words, it's gonna gain kinetic energy. And that energy had to come from somewhere. That's the stored energy waiting to be used. So we're gonna go back to the idea that this is from the beginning of our course, but we assume that the ground level is our zero point. In other words, zero height at the surface. If that's the case, if you see like over here on the right where we're lifting a book, we're saying y equals zero at the surface. 
and then it's raised some height above zero. Well, if your height is zero, so is your gravitational potential energy. So we are saying that we are assuming there's no gravitational potential energy at the height zero, which is the surface. So our equation for gravitational potential energy for an object of mass m, a height y above the ground, is simply mgy. But let's see where that comes from. Um, so I'll just write this. I just popped that up so I can see where I can write. Uh, so let's show where this comes from. This stems from the work energy equation. We know work equals a change in energy. In this case, we're talking about gravitational potential energy. Well, again, we know work is given by FD. So we have FD equals your change in gravitational potential energy. But in this case, the energy that we're talking about is that, or excuse me, the force that we're talking about, the force acting on the book in this picture is its weight. So we can replace the force with the equation for weight, which is mg. Right, so the force acting on the object is weight, or mg. So we have mgd in this case, or Really, uh, if you recall the way we used to write displacement, this is the same as saying mg delta y. All right, so displacement d is the same as this. In this case, we're being specific about the direction. It's vertical, so we're saying the displacement is a change in your y value. So uh, at this point, then, you basically just were assuming it's zero potential energy at the surface. So that basically just allows us to get rid of the delta term and say mgy equals ug. And that is our equation. So again, it goes from deltas to no deltas, from the second to last step to the last, because we're assuming y is 0 and ug is 0 at the surface. So that's where the equation comes from. Now there is an important dis like technicality here. The gravitational potential energy depends only on the height above the ground. It does not matter what path the object took to get there. So in the picture that I just pulled up here, you can see a hiker taking two different routes. They're starting down here at the bottom left, and then they're ending up at the top right. They took completely different paths. So this person walks up a single, very steep hill Whereas this person walks up a shallow steep hill and then a second one to get there. It doesn't matter what path they took, they are changing their energy by the same amount because they have the same starting point and ending point. This is true, for example, uh, it would be ill-advised, but if you were to walk straight up a mountain, literally straight up the mountain, versus walking around it in a spiral pattern, just, you know, a much greater distance but spiraling around it so it's not as steep, as long as you end up at the same point, you still are changing your energy by the same amount. So it's just a technicality to make sure you understand that um, it does not matter what path you're taking. As crazy as it is, if you have the same initial and final points, it's the same energy. So we have another new type of energy, so let's work on another example, 29.2. This is a very simple one, but I think it's just kind of an interesting one. So, in the Empire State Building run-up, competitors race up the 1,576 steps, climbing a total distance of 320 meters vertically. It asks, how much gravitational potential energy does a 70 kilogram racer gain? So, we're asked to figure out the gain, so we're talking about delta, in potential energy, so UG. It's asking us to figure out delta UG, the gain in gravitational potential energy. So we know that uh, change means final minus initial, so I'm going to write this as UG final minus UG initial. That's really all we're looking to solve for. Now again, we could write this out in full and say, okay, so we have mgy final minus mgy initial. But as we just talked about, 
We always assume that the ground level is our zero point. We're, we're not assuming, we're choosing it to be zero. So our initial y position is zero. It's at the ground. I'll write at ground level. So it's zero. You don't have to cross it out here and write at ground level. You could just plug zero in, but I think it's just easier to get rid of the term and not have to deal with it down the road. So all that's left over is mgy final. We have a mass of 70 kilograms. G is our acceleration due to gravity, the standard 9.8 meters per second squared. And then the distance that they travel vertically is 320 meters. So multiplying all three of these values together gives you a pretty large value of 2.2 times 10 to the 5 joules of energy. Now that sounds like a lot, and it is, but I mean, think about how tired you would probably be after walking up the entire Empire State Building. You are changing your energy by a lot because you're raising yourself up by a significant distance. So it does make sense that we have a pretty large value for this problem. Okay, well, that's our second of four major types of energy. At this point, let's now move on to the third. Our third type of energy is elastic potential energy. Before we get into defining the equation or coming up with the equation for it, we actually have to introduce how to define the force that you have to use to compress or stretch a spring. So, First, let's talk about something called Hooke's Law, H-O-O-K-E. Hooke's Law defines the force necessary to compress a spring or stretch it, or alternatively, it is the force that is the restoring force of the string, of the spring, excuse me, pushing back on you. So I have two sets of equations here, F equals negative Kx or positive Kx. Well, this negative one here is the restoring force. So this is the force of the spring pushing back, hence the negative sign. But if you are talking about a force, that's a really bad arrow, a force that you are applying onto the spring, then you look at the positive equation. So I'll write uh, for something acting on it. We'll say on the spring. So you have to apply kx of force to compress the spring, but the spring is going to be pushing back by the same amount. This is basically a Newton's third law setup, right? Newton's third law says every force, in a general sense, every force is a pair of forces equal and opposite. So be careful. Um, in this case, for our purposes, at least for my students, we're really just going to deal with the positive form of this equation. We're going to be talking about the force you apply to the spring. Now, be careful too, because the K in this equation is not capital K. It is not kinetic energy. Lowercase k in this equation is a constant known as the spring constant. This is a measure of how rigid or strong your spring is. And when you think about it, it makes sense. If you want to compress or stretch a spring, springs certainly vary in how sturdy they are. Uh, for example, you could pull out the spring of your pen and squish that spring really easily, but then go outside and look at the spring that your cars use for shocks. Um, you can see like a big spiral coil in the wheel well sometimes. That is a much sturdier spring. It's a much more rigid spring. It would be a little bit harder to compress that with your hands. So there has to be some sort of a variable in our equations, well, a constant in our equations, that defines that rigidness of the spring. And that's exactly what K does. The units of this are newtons per meter. And then X in this equation is how far your spring is stretched or compressed. So you can see that here. X is how far you are displacing your spring from equilibrium, how far you stretch or compress it. So this brings us now to the discussion of energy. The equation for 
the elastic potential energy is given as one half kx squared. As I did with the past two forms of energy, let's go ahead and show where this comes from. And again, this one comes from the work energy equation. We know work is equal to a change in energy. In this case, we're talking about a change in elastic potential energy, US. Well, as we've done before, we say that work is force times displacement. So let's swap that out to start. So force times displacement equals our change in energy. Well, in this case, we have two things that we can do. We can say our force, I'll explain this, is one half kx. And our displacement is x. So you might be asking, so why are we doing one half kx here? Why isn't it just the kx? Well, we're talking about a change in our spring potential energy, right? So what we're saying is the force here is really the average force. This is the average force. So it's initially zero. So we'll just uh, say initially zero, but then kx after. So the average is then one half of that. So that's where the one half is coming from. It's an average between zero and the overall force kx. So you can see what happens here then. Um, our uh, equation here just becomes one half kx squared. The delta goes away again because we are assuming that it's equal to zero when the spring isn't compressed or stretched at all. So uh, the zero is put in and thus we lose the delta term. So that brings us to our equation for spring potential energy. Again, because we just introduced a new energy, let's work on another example. This problem says an archer pulls back the string of her bow by 70 centimeters with a force of 140 newtons. How much elastic potential energy is stored in the bow before release? Okay, so be careful here because if we wanted to solve, I'm going to, I'm going to keep this up here, but we're not going to use it right away. If we want to solve for this energy, we need to know, we need to know both K and X. We do know X. That's how far the bow is pulled back, but we don't know how rigid the bow is. We don't know the constant K. So we're going to have to solve for K first. So that's what we'll do first. We're going to apply Hooke's law. F equals kx. In other words, k is equal to F over x. We need to know what that spring constant is so we can actually solve for this energy. So we just plug in our values of the 140 newton force divided by the 0 0.7 meter displacement to give us a constant of 200 newtons per meter. Well, now we can actually solve this problem. We can solve for our uh, spring potential energy or elastic potential energy now because we have both K and X to plug in. So we have one half, the spring constant that we just solved for, 200 newtons per meter times the quantity of the displacement, which is 0 0.7 meters quantity squared. It's very easy to forget squares, so don't, don't forget that. And this will give you about 49 joules. A fairly meager amount of energy, but 49 joules is our answer. So, uh, this is a situation where we had to apply two equations to get to our answer, right? Because again, we wanted to solve right away, but we didn't know what k was. So we had to find a way to solve for that first. Okay. Well, this then brings us to our final of the four energies.
and that was thermal energy. Conceptually a little bit harder to understand, but I try to lay it out here as clearly as possible. When we talk about thermal energy, we're talking about the hotness of the object. So when we talk about a hot object, the atoms within it are going to be oscillating more than those in a cold object. So this has two really, really important results. First of all, the atoms are moving faster. Remember, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So if the atoms are moving faster, they have greater kinetic energy. Right, so the hotter the object, the more kinetic energy it will have. Further, when we're talking about solids, like you see in the images on the right, the, the atoms in those objects are bonded together. In, this, in these pictures, they're shown by little squiggly lines that look like springs. Atoms are bonded together, but those bonds can compress and stretch, just like a spring. So as these atoms start moving faster and faster and faster, they are stretching and compressing their bonds greater and greater and greater, more and more, right? So the faster the atoms move in place or the faster they vibrate back and forth in place, the more they are stretching and compressing those bonds. Well, because they're like springs, that's a bunch of little potential energies stored up there because you are stretching and compressing a spring effectively. So not only does a hotter object have greater kinetic energy, but it also has greater potential energy because of that stretching of the bonds. So that's what we said the definition of thermal energy was. It was the sum of kinetic and potential energies. Now, that being said, the kinetic energy of a single atom is going to be really, really small because they're so low in mass. But, objects are made up of a whole lot of atoms and bonds. So even though each individual energy is very, very, very small, there's so many of them that it actually, it actually matters. Uh, it's not something we can always ignore. So the sum of those potential and kinetic energies, again, is what we call thermal energy, which we represent with the symbol E subscript TH for thermal. So the equation for thermal energy is delta ETH equals friction, FK, kinetic friction that is, times the displacement delta X. Now, this is only relevant in problems where friction is involved. In the real world, that's pretty much everywhere. In basic physics classes like this, that's only in certain situations. So. If your problem does not have friction, you will not have to deal with thermal energy because there won't be any friction in your problem, so you won't have to worry about it. Uh, so, um, let's go ahead and just real quick show where this equation comes from. Oops. So, this equation, delta ETH, I'll just write this up toward the top. It again comes from the work energy equation. So, the change in thermal energy is equal to the work done. As we've done in the last two examples, work is given by force times displacement. So F times D. But we are spe specifying a horizontal surface. Uh, in this case, I mean, it could be a vertical surface. You could write delta Y. But most surfaces we deal with are horizontal. So the force that's being involved is friction. And the displacement is in the X direction. So we label it as delta X. And there's your equation. So pretty direct derivation in this case. Something to note, and this is uh, a, a bit odd, um, is that we are writing this as delta ETH with the delta there. When we talked about kinetic energy or gravitational potential energy or even spring potential energy, we didn't keep the deltas. But we do here. So uh, you have to always have a delta here because you can't ever have just, you can't ever calculate just the thermal energy at an instant. It's always a change because it's only ever caused by friction acting over a displacement. So you have to change your position so you have a change in the thermal energy. Uh, so just keep in mind that it will always stay as a delta ETH. There's no such thing as just writing, say, ETH 
uh, you know, final or initial. So a small technicality to keep in mind. Okay, well, uh, I saved all the conservation of energy talk for the next lecture. I split this one up because it's already a long enough lecture. So let's go ahead and close this one out with just two questions at the end. So uh, question one, it says rank in order from largest to smallest the gravitational potential energies of the balls. So you have uh, the ball in position one, two, three, and four, rank them in terms of their gravitational potential energy. Okay, well, we know the equation is mgy for gravitational potential energy. We're assuming, of course, that gravity is the same at all points and that the mass of the object is the same. I mean, the picture, it looks like it's the same object in all of them. So the mass and the, the uh, acceleration due to gravity should be the same throughout. So really, the only thing we're focused on is the height of the ball. Basically, this is just a question asking you, rank the balls based on how high they are off the ground. Three is the highest, two and four are next, and then one. The answer is D. Three is the highest, then two and four the next highest, then one. So it's really just a measure of how far off the surface your objects are. This brings us to our last question. Question two. Starting from rest, a marble first rolls down a steeper hill, then down a less steep hill of the same height. Friction is negligible. For which is it going faster at the bottom? Okay. So this is a really interesting one, and this is one that uh, physics students should know. This is actually something you might see even on like a standardized test going into grad school or something if you were to be as crazy as to do that. Um, so the first thing to realize is the energy conversion that's taking place is gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. They're starting high off the ground at rest, so they have a lot of gravitational potential energy, but no kinetic energy. But as they roll down, they are losing gravitational potential energy because they're getting closer to the ground level, but they're picking up speed. So they're gaining kinetic energy. Okay, well, think about what's happening. They are starting at the same height. We'll say same height y. They are ending at the same height. In other words, they have the same change in height. So as a result, they are going to have the same change in gravitational potential energy, which further means they're going to have the same change in kinetic energy. So they're going to pick up speed by the same amount. The answer is C in this case. They are traveling the same change in height, so they have the same change in gravitational potential energy, which means they then have the same change in kinetic energy. So they increase their speed by the same amount. They're moving at the same speed. Now, I will say as a technicality, if friction were to be involved, that might be slightly different because uh, the one on the right has to travel a greater distance across the surface, which means there's more time for friction to act on it. But even if there was friction, I mean, unless it's some really sticky, bizarre surface, the friction would be so negligible, you probably wouldn't notice anyways. So for all intents and purposes, it really would just be the same at the bottom. So really fascinating question, I think. Okay, well, this is our entire foundation now. We've talked about work and come up with an equation for work. We've talked about each type of energy and come up with an equation for each one. Now we move on to lecture 30, which is conservation of energy, where we put all of that stuff together into one situation that we talk about and solve problems based on. So I will catch you in lecture 30. As always, have a great day, everyone.